Good morning, everybody. This is the Innovation Conversation. I'm Kevin Coop. And I'm Tom Furphy. Uh, Tom, good to see you. I can see you're on the road this week. We've switched places. I was on the road last time. So We've been on the move. Things are getting back to <laughs> some semblance of normality, I guess. A little bit. Although the mask is always close by. The thing I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about this morning was there was actually a story that ran yesterday on Morning Newsbeat um, that I think raises a larger issue. Um, and the, the, the specific story was about how um, 10 minutes is starting to be the bar for in certain cases in terms of grocery delivery. Um, that there's all sorts of companies, both in Europe and, and here in the United States, who are saying, okay, we can do 10 minute delivery, which seems very, very specific. And this comes after we know that Instacart is now doing 30 minute delivery for Giant and Stop and Shop and Kroger in, in a, I think one or two markets. Um, they're doing hour delivery or two hour delivery for Family Dollar or one of the dollar store chains. So speed is clearly on everybody's mind. But as I read the story and started doing my original commentary, I kept wondering to myself, is the, is the focus on, on speed, did we run the risk of, of focusing on that exclusively and not focusing on other things that may in the end be more important to the customer and frankly, may be more sustainable over the long term? Yeah, I mean, I think it's all about... Um you know, re recognizing and serving the various trip types, right? And the, the, the 10 minute need, right? And by the way, how many people can actually leave their residence, go to the store and even come back in 10 minutes, right? So this is even way faster than you could do on your own. I've got a Whole Foods, I've got a Whole Foods <laughs> literally a less than a quarter mile from my house. And I can't do it in 10 minutes. Right, because you have to get there, you got to get out of the car, you got to travel a pretty right. large store. And yeah, and so it's certainly going to take longer. But, you know, there, you know, you're serving an urgent need, right? I've, you know, I'm in the middle of making a meal and I need a key ingredient. I've got people coming over and I've got to put out a spread for them last minute. Or, I don't know, I got the munchies and I, I want to get, you know, something from the grocery <laughs> store fast. Um, so I'm sure there's a trip type there. And, you know, obviously 10 minutes is pretty darn fast. I mean, you think about how that has to work, right? you have to be picking that order within a minute of when it comes in, right? So you have to have a team there ready, the order comes in, you have to have a small facility. We know these are small dark stores, right? right. You have to have a small facility with not a ton of SKUs, right? To be able to actually route your picker through, get everything picked and get on the road by foot, by bike, by however, um, to get that delivered. Um, you know, it's a, uh, it's definitely a, um, I don't want to call it niche because th there might be a really big need for it. Um, it's a trip type. And, you know, that's where a lot of money is being spent now and where a lot of the battles taking place. And, and not to put myself in the position where I'm being in, uh, just a naysayer for the sake of being a naysayer, it just also occurs to me that things can go wrong, right? That might work well at three o'clock in the afternoon or eight o'clock at night when you get one or two orders in requiring a 10 minute delivery window. But at 12 noon or 6 p.m., you might get 12 at the same time and suddenly, what if you don't have enough? What if, what if you have 12 pickers and you get 13 orders? Or what if, you know, there seems to me there's the opportunity, there, there's the potential for disappointing customers. And that's a risk if you, right? If you, if you, if you make a value, if, if you make it core to your value proposition and you're not able to deliver on it, it seems to me that's, a, that's dangerous. At some yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I think a lot of stuff in e-commerce, frankly, can be dangerous, right? So I think retailers do have to take risks here and have to be willing to stub your toe. You know, obviously you don't want to stub it cons consistently. You don't want to create an ongoing bad experience. Um, I think customers appreciate when you're innovating uh, for them. So you get a little bit of leeway, but I, but you're right. I mean, it's a, um, uh, it, it's, I, I mean, the, the complexity around being able to serve you know, surges in demand or troughs in demand. I mean, 10 minutes is a pretty tight window. Right. Um, you better have, you know, the staff available, you know, pronto on demand to, to serve it. And, um, and I'm sure obviously these are, these companies are spending a lot of, of capital um, determining how to optimize, right? Optimizing the assortment, optimizing how it's laid out, optimizing where the dark stores are put, um, you know, optimizing how to read, you know, when demand is going to surge and, and you know, and, and understanding that. Um, 
there's a lot of complexity in that. Frankly, there's a lot of complexity overall in grocery e-commerce. To me, this like on-demand uh, element is probably the most complex. Yeah. The other the other thing I, I, I talked a little bit about yesterday, I did want to get your reaction to this, was, was that while, again, speed is important, there's all, and, and that's all about efficiency, that there's another issue, which is that of effectiveness. And I guess the, the point I made yesterday was that, you know, when I think about what Amazon's strengths are, yeah, it's great that I get two-day delivery and half the time I get, you know, get it in a day, you know, and, and although they've, they've, they, have, they have avoided promising one-day delivery for Prime because they haven't been able to kind of get to the point where they feel secure making that, 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 um, that offer. But, it, but to, I think about Amazon Prime and the way that, you know, it's just set up and I see broad value in that, in that system. And even more than that, subscribe and save, which is the auto replenishment, something you're familiar with it because you built it for Amazon um, and continue to be involved in that space today. Now, those things have nothing really to do with speed. Those have to do with understanding my needs as a customer and being able to detect future needs as a customer and deliver on that, which I think is is more valuable to me. Uh, that's to, to, to my way of thinking. Is that a fair observation? Yeah, I totally, I totally get that. I mean, obviously, we we're making a bet in auto replenishment because we think it is really important, right? We think that <clears throat> the the large swaths of stuff that customers buy on a regular basis that becomes really predictable, you can build a service to you know, take the burden off of folks, like not having to remember what to get when, not having to go through, you know, the labor of searching and browsing and going to prior purchases and, you know, pulling all that stuff up into a, up into an e-commerce order or going to the store for these mundane runs, right? You can use machine learning to take that burden off of folks to free up all that time, you know, give them good visibility so they know what they need, you know, um, or they know what they're going to get and they have the ability to, to, to modify that, right? And, you know, something might take them five or eight minutes versus, you know, 25 minutes to shop for something. Like, right. So there's there's effectiveness there and you're you're really taking care of a customer need and lightening the burden for them there. Um, so I think as you look across these, these trip types, I mean, you know, for some people that tend to maybe be more last minute or maybe you're single and, you know, like I said, those use cases earlier, I mean, you know, there's, it's if you can get good at those, you can be effective, you know, right. for those, but, you know, I think for any retailer, you just gotta. Um, you know, we always we always say this because this is very Amazonian, but you know, start with your customer, right? Right. Obsess over their needs, and then work backward into building services to serve that. Yeah. And I think if you look at, you know, all the various trip behaviors, you know, that happen in traditional brick and mortar and now are moving into e-commerce, you know, there's different capabilities that serve that. There's not a one size you know, fits, fits everything. You kind of, as a retailer, you really want to offer kind of, e you know, each of these things in concert in a way that's meaningful to your shoppers overall. Yeah. Yeah. I guess what I was thinking about when I was, when I, when I, as I've been reading these stories and trying to formulate commentary about it was that I, I wonder if, if retailers, if they're just viewing e-commerce as as an alternative delivery system, as a, you know, so you people kind of shop in the store, they can pick up at the curb or they can have it delivered to their houses. And I think that a lot of retailers view it that way. Are they ignoring the larger potential, which is to, it, which is that customer knowledge and creating some level of, of intimacy that makes them indispensable? In other words, not, it, it, I guess what I'm thinking is if you don't, if you don't activate that piece of the puzzle, you're actually, you're, then you're not, it's not, small, it's not a small thing, right? It's, mm -hmm. Then it's just a logistics play, right? Yeah, 100%. As it's opposed connected. to being a customer service play. Absolutely. It, yeah, I think it's actually the next generation of loyalty play. Right. Right. It's, it's understanding your customer building this suite of services, right? That serve their various needs and their various use cases. And that they as a customer are recognized across these trip types, right? So if I'm in the store and I'm shopping and I go through the front end, 
or if I'm at home and I want a quick 10 minute delivery, or if it's my auto replan, you know, stuff, or if it's just my regular Thursday morning, you know, be at home delivery or my, my pickup on a Tuesday. Um, <clears throat> I think retailers really need to, and, and, and there's a lot of retailers that are making great strides in this now, right? Retailers need to recognize their customer across these trip types and, you know, and, 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 and serve them in concert uh, across these. And it's, and it is, I think it's a lot less about, you know, logistics and channels and, you know, thinking of it that way. I mean, logistics is a big piece of it. It's a big cost driver. So you do need to understand and optimize for the, you know, for lowering the costs of the various options. Uh, because you can't drive your cost to serve up, you know, crazy high. Um, but I think, you know, recognizing the value of a customer across these and having that customer treated in a way that that makes them feel like the retailer values their business and understands them and can use these, you know, these machine learning techniques or use this data, you know, to be able to kind of, you know, be that kind of almost like that personal uh, assistant almost across that, um, you know, Hey, this retailer really knows me and they, they're, they're, you know, they're appealing to, you know, my various needs across these trip types and they recognize me for that. I think that that's, that's where the ultimate magic is going to be unlocked. Well, and, and isn't that, I mean, I can remember from almost, from pretty much the beginning of Amazon prime thinking to myself and writing that it was like the, it, it, it was the world's biggest, best loyalty marketing program. That's what it was. Because it, every it built into it was um, every, and you paid for it, which was unlike most loyalty, right? It was you paid for this loyalty marketing program, and there was all sorts of incentives in there for you to use it as much as Absolutely. possible, and you got more value out of it the more you used it. And which is so, which is, and again, it's not to put Amazon on a pedestal, it's just to say that they look at the world differently. You know, how many other retailers have loyalty marketing programs and, and their definition of a loyalty marketing program is to just deliver coupons totally. and they're not even necessarily targeting coupons. Right. And so to, to me, it's it's about and that and it even comes back. And I'm not sure that it's a, it's a it's an apples to apples comparison, but it's the same thing about speed versus um, you know, or, uh, efficiency versus effectiveness. Right. You've got to me, it's really important to to think beyond the tactical, which Absolutely. is logistics, and to think about the strategy, which is about all about customer understanding and customer service. Yeah, you know, I think you, you have to get the logistics side right because if you don't, you fail the customer, right? right? If, you're, if the stuff's not ready when it's due to be picked up or if there's a bunch of out of stocks or, you know, if the delivery's late, right? Those things ultimately, you know, over time can really degrade the customer experience. So you do have to get that right. Um, you know, and that's, you think back to, to Prime, I mean, yeah, Prime, you pay it, you, it, you know, you paid, I think it was $79 initially, um, and you got, you know, this expedited delivery, and there was good value in that, and then, right, Amazon kept layering on additional services, and you, you, know, the, you know, you'd hear uh, Jeff B, you know, say that, you know, I, I want our customers to feel like they're being negligent to not be a Prime member and to utilize, right. you know, all the great services that it, that it, that it makes available. Yeah. But I, I do think it, it and while I, I take your point that there are a lot of retailers out there who are who are th starting to th the process of thinking about this differently, there's still a lot of retailers out there who who are not, right? Absolutely. Who, who are and I and I, to me that it could end up being the line between the ones who are successful and the ones yes. who are not. And in some ways. And it's not only about technology, right? Because there's a lot of small retailers out there who have to start to think differently about this stuff because they're going up against retailers with much more resources. So if they, so can't, think, in our if they, if they can't think innovatively internally about how to deliver a better customer service model, then they're, then they're just going to be out of luck. So we see in our business, we see, <clears throat> we see lots of retailers not doing enough. Um, but we see, you know, small retailers, you know, super customer focused, really thinking about taking care of this customer across these different purchase journeys, right? And, and recognizing their loyalty uh, through that. Um, and we see that with really big retailers as well. And you, you see uh, like a new type of talent being hired 
my region, you see a lot more data scientists, right? Which, you know, data science is super important. You got to wrap it though in like really good customer service and put it to good use. Right. Um, or like you can, you, you can fumble it pretty bad, uh, but good data science. And then, you know, we see retailers bringing folks in from the hotel industry, you know, in the airline industry where, you know, these are, these are industries that have had, you know, big loyalty programs, well-established uh, and have had to, you know, really fight their, their customer, uh, you know, their market battle through these loyalty programs and bring that into, into the grocery space or into the retail space. You know, that's a, that's a, that's a big move. And I think you're going to see, I think you are going to see some separation uh, between those that are really focused on building great programs for their customers right. um, and treating them as valuable individuals uh, and those that aren't. Yeah. And especially if, if in fact the projections are right and the pandemic is going to begin to sort of recede and be in the rear view mirror, I, I think what's going to happen now is that now you're going to really start to see the separation, right? I, I suspect yeah. because the ones who have been surviving on the momentum created for this industry by the pandemic suddenly are going to lose that traction. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, the, the, yeah, as the, what I say is the, as the water level lowers, you know, you're going to, I don't know exactly what it means. As, a, as, the, as, the, as the tide goes out, we're going to find out who's been swimming naked. Exactly. That's, I think that's oh, the, <laughs> the line yeah. you're looking for. Uh, and, and I've been to enough executive meetings in, in, in this industry over 30 or 40 years of covering it. I don't want to see who's naked. So no. I just, it's just not a pleasant. And by the way, <laughs> they don't want to see me either. So. <laughs> And with that oh. image, we will end this edition, leaving that image in everybody's minds. We will end this edition of the Innovation Conversation. Tom, as always, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, everyone. Travel, travel safe. And we'll be back in two weeks with another edition of the Innovation Conversation.